Hello, Yeshua Network. Nathan Wheeler here with video number 34 of the 40 Day Challenge. Another day closer to our victory of 40 days. Blessed for the testing and the challenge. It is, uh, it is truly an experience to be had. If you have not participated or started in it yet and you're just watching this video for the first time, uh, I welcome you all to click the link in the description and that you would uh, watch from the very first video, which obviously explains what this is. Super blessed to have you today. For those of you watching live, we are running uh, a good bit late, 25 minutes late. Uh, just really needed to stay with the Lord and not, not jump the gun. Uh, I've learned my lesson long ago that uh, if I have not heard from the Lord yet, I need not move. So even if that means that sometimes we are a little bit late on the human schedule, uh, I, I am not going to hit the rock, if you will. <laughs> Moses reference there. Uh, lesson learned. So uh, thank you for your patience and so blessed to uh, be with you today. And we do have two passages that are very much of the same topic uh, really emphasizing additional things that we discussed yesterday. Also yesterday, we talked about being bold in our faith. What do we fear if God is with us? And I thought it was really cool that we have a shirt that somebody made me, Ninja for the Lord, Joint and Morrow. If you guys don't know the reference, that's pretty cool. So I thought this was a good shirt to wear today since we had talked about that yesterday. Thank you for the brother who designed this and, and sent me the shirt and everything. I really appreciate everybody who's who's put together really cool things like this. That's super, that's super cool. Uh, it's actually fun to wear stuff like this. It's awesome. Great, great witnessing tool too. People are like, Ninja for the Lord? You're like, yeah, let me talk to you about it. So yeah, super cool stuff. Um, day 34. Can you believe we only have six more days left? Kind of crazy, huh? I guess technically after today, it'd be five more days left. Five more days left. So, uh, First Corinthians. Oh, we gotta pray. We gotta make sure we invite the Lord obviously in and come into us and open our ears and eyes. Hallelujah. So if you guys would join me, whether you're watching live or recorded in prayer, Lord is outside of time and space. So, Almighty Jehovah, in the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we first wanna thank you for this day. We want to thank you for everything you have ever given us and everything you have taken away. We thank you, Lord, for the cross. We thank you for the blood of the Lamb that washes us clean. We thank you for the resurrection and we thank you for the ascension and the promise thereof in unto us. We thank you, Lord, for we know that we were sinners when you did that for us. We know that we were your enemy while you did that for us so that we would have just a chance, a chance to turn to you see you in your goodness, see you in your act of love and grace and mercy and respond. And we truly give thanks for that. We give thanks for the ministry you have bestowed upon us here at Yeshua Network and Truth Me Free. We thank you, Lord, for the fellowship of people who are gathering from all around the world, from all different walks and backgrounds. And Lord, we just thank you that you have allowed us all to understand in this ministry what fellowship is without judgment, without hatred, without segregation, without without uh, any kind of click uh, energy, Lord, and, 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 and human behavior. I really feel, Lord, you have given us a wonderful example here, and we must give thanks and praise for that because not everybody gets to experience that. So we hope and we pray for this, this ministry. We hope and pray for the holiness in every single one of us to increase and for pride to decrease, for our ego and ourselves to decrease, that there always be more of you in us than of ourselves, that you may be glorified, Lord, that your name may be known, that we as individuals and as a body of Christ be examples and ambassadors of you on earth, that all that we are and all that we do as individuals and as a body may forever glorify you in Yeshua HaMashiach's name. Give us more of you, fill us up that we may spill onto all those we come in contact with today. Make today a special day, a day that you have allowed us to experience you more than ever before. And may we go out into the world carrying you with us, that we may be the influence with the Holy Spirit's power, rather than the world's sin and darkness and stumbling blocks influencing us. In Yeshua HaMashiach's name, we give thanks and praise. Amen. Hallelujah. Ninjas for the Lord. What? Oh, yeah. Okay, let's start with number one, 1 Corinthians 7, 17. Let's get this show on the road, as they say. All righty. 
This is good stuff. Okay. Only let each per- blah, 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 blah. take two. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. Not which God is in which choice of gods, but which God himself has called that individual to. Little little little, uh, little fancy writing there. Okay. There's so much. I'm sorry. Give me a second, guys. Give me a second. This is why that we were late today. Because I it's like there's a thousand things going on in my head, and I'm like trying to allow myself to just allow it to come through. I feel like I need to give just a general preference so that we are on preface preference preface to to what is going to be addressed today it'll just make it uh, maybe a little bit more clear so the the passages we're going to read today is um from paul first corinthians and it's really a redundant message that he seems to have to really beat into their heads and i feel that it is a message that really needs to be beat into the heads of many believers today as well and as we are going into holiness and as we are going to begin to witness the comfort zone of beyond the fire and we begin to experience the the absolute amazing grace and love and just all the wonderful goodness of actually being on our father's feet and dancing with him in the gala, uh, we're going to never want to leave it. It's just a natural thing and there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing bad about that. Uh, but if we understand that our father just didn't, didn't call us to just have that experience, we are to have that experience, but not just have that experience, that we must understand we are ambassadors and, we, and he is sending us out. He is entrusting in us with his most valuable possession, and that is souls. He is entrusting in us to be ambassadors with his truth, his most powerful tool, his most, his most, most powerful chain-breaking uh, ability, which is the truth of Yeshua and the Messiah and the gospel. He sends us out with it, and he says, go free more of my sheep. Go bring them home to me. I want more of my children in the palace. I want more dances in the gala. I love you, but I want more. And uh, and, and if we really understand that, um, and we really go out, you know, we can go out with a, a, I know I'm speaking very plainly here, and I know I'm talking about something that maybe some of us haven't experienced yet on day 34, but we can ironically take that commandment from the Lord, and we can kind of take it and turn and go back into the world, if you will, and go back into the fire, and we can kind of resent uh, non-believers, and we can kind of resent uh, people who aren't aren't you know through the flame yet, and we can kind of have a resentment towards them because we're thinking to ourselves, if you would have just been right with the Lord, if you would just you know do it on your own, if you would just you know uh, just walk right with God, I wouldn't have to come back and get you. I wouldn't have to be away from my dance with the Father. So there, it's really weird that we can actually take the full glory and have the wonderful experience of dancing with our Father in the gala, and then he gives us a commandment after the dance and says, okay, now I want you to go back. Now that you've experienced this total, immersive, massive blessing, and I want you to go and make sure that I have as many children having this experience as possible. I want you to go and get more. And then it's just like, I have to give up, you know, this really fluffy, cozy time with you. And I got to go get people that are, don't even want to know you, don't even, aren't even recognizing you. And we can have a little bit of resentment. And, uh, and, and I want to acknowledge that it's, it's a little understandable, right? Uh, and this is where we're going to get refined a little bit more. We're going to get refined a little bit more and know that while we are still always in this vessel, this vessel of flesh, there will always be an ego to fight. There will always be a pride to fight, always. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that it's really important that we understand that when we come at people, we must love them with the heart of Christ. Uh, we can't love them as, as our own. We have to love them as Christ loved, which is the commandment we read yesterday. Love one another as I have loved you, not just love one another as you love yourself, because that can if we if we really love one another as we love ourselves it can kind of become a little bit like 
but I, if I love you as I love myself, well, I love myself just a little bit more, and it, and then we can carry the resentment in. And ironically, while we're serving God, we can have resentment. So, okay, I think you get this. Maybe you'll have to watch this video later, further down the line when you're in that realm and be like, Nathan, I think talked about this in video somewhere towards the end of the 40 day challenge. And hopefully you will remember that when you, when you kind of start to feel a little bit of resentment or a little bit of frustration and angst towards non-believers or people who say they believe, but they're not really walking the walk, you may find that angst in you. So maybe come back to this, to this video. And, and I pray, and I pray it will bless you because Paul really, I think, nails it with this. He really drills it into their heads here in Corinthians. Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to, to them. I'm going to change the word from him to them because then it's more unisex, if you will, to them and to which God has led them. This is my rule to all churches. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. So basically, was anybody when they were called by Yeshua, were they Jewish? If they were Jewish, well then don't let them remove the signs of their Jewishness, right? Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Were they not Jewish? Were they Gentile? Let him not seek to be circumcised. Now that's, that's interesting. To be circumcised is to respond to the Mosaic law, to the Levitical law, because God says that his blessings will not be on you. And he even threatened to kill Moses. Literally, he says, I will kill you if you do not go and circumcise your son. And his wife got super pissed because she didn't want her son's Tallywhacker to be mutilated. Uh, you know, she didn't really understand this promise of the Lord. And she says how much she hates him for doing it. And then here's Moses stuck in a rock in a hard place. So it's a really big deal, this circumcision thing. Yes, we already discussed about how circumcision of the heart is to cut away everything that is like not needed. I know it's super weird, but you get what I'm saying. We already discussed this. It's, it's, it's the part not needed, I guess you could say. It's, and then it symbolizes that we are his, right? The, the important part of circumcision is that it symbolizes we are his. So that's for the Jewish. That's for the Jewish culture. But here Paul is saying that if somebody is not physically, if a, if a, if a man who is a Gentile uh, is not physically circumcised, the Old Testament says that if he wants to be in the Jewish culture, if he wants to embrace and be considered amongst God's people, Jewish law says he must be circumcised. It's not, it's not a thing. It, whether you're an adult, whether you're eight days old, it, it, if you come in later, you got to get snippety the tippet, right? You got to. So, so here Paul is going technically against Jewish law. He's going against Levitical Mosaic law, right? Let him not seek circumcision, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor circumcision. Both of them. It doesn't matter if a person has a physical appearance of being in God's family or not. If there's any kind of earthly uh, expression, uh, whether it's circumcision is just the example he's giving, but if there is some kind of flesh, earthly expression that a person is in God's family, right? He says this has no count. It, it, it doesn't matter. Whatever the physical expression is, it doesn't matter. For neither circumcision counts for any nor for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Now this is really strange because being circumcised is a commandment of God. So we could definitely get super stuck here. And the body of Christ globally is. There are people who are total legalistic, go back to the Mosaic law and keep going and keep going. And you got to, you got to command, you got to be a, totally a part of the Mosaic law and the Levitical law. If you don't, you are not right with God, right? There's many people around the world who are truly under this belief system. And they're under the belief system based upon scripture written in the New Testament. But if that is the case, then Paul here is blaspheming. He is literally teaching blasphemy. Now, what's interesting is, is that Paul takes this argument to the council of the apostles and he calls Peter out on this. And he says, you know that circumcision no longer has 
It's, it's no longer a requirement from God. And Peter is trying to always bring up that, that there, there needs to be circumcision, but he knows that it's not because he admits in the scriptures that he's scared of the Jews. He's scared of pissing off the, the Jews, and he wants the Jews to like him because his ministry is on to the Jews. So he's, he's trying to appease God, he's trying to appease the people, and he's trying to appease the high-ranking rabbis. He's trying to unite, unite the clans, right? Braveheart style, unite them, unite the clans. And Peter's got a really tough job. But Paul comes in, he's like, screw making everybody happy, only make God happy and follow his commandments. So this can, can be where everybody gets really confused, and they are. And some churches say, oh, you just have to raise your hand, and you just have to say, I believe in Yeshua, and bam, wham, that's it, you're done, you get to go to heaven, nothing more needs to ever be done, right? Do you understand how this is confusing? So I don't, I don't want, uh, you know, to have anybody move into holiness uh, and and begin to see the benefits of the Old Testament and and the Hebrew laws, and then they become convicted, which the the Spirit of the Lord may do. The Spirit of the Lord may have you as you read through the entire Bible. You get to the Old Testament, and you're like, dang, I feel really convicted. Like I need to maybe get circumcised if that's what you need to do and you're a guy or I'm a woman I need to start covering my hair or I need to only wear dresses or um, I as a man I need to grow a beard and I need to never shave it um, you know there's all these things that biblically uh, we can look back through the Old Testament the Levitical law and the Mosaic law and we can say that speaks to me there's an intimacy within this law that really allows me to feel closer to my father. And I feel as though the spirit is calling me to no longer keep maybe the holidays of Christmas and Easter and Halloween, but maybe now in my new convictions. And as I grow closer to God, I feel like, like I want to keep the festivals of the moon. I want to keep the festivals that God has, has commanded me to do. But this is not a salvation issue. This is a holiness issue. And if you've been around my ministry for a long time, you've heard me explain to you that there are two different types of issues. There is a holy issue and a salvation issue. And a holy issue is dependent upon each individual as the Holy Spirit speaks onto them, as the Holy Spirit convicts onto them. And you're saying, Nathan, is that is that really scriptural though? Are you, are you manipulating this? Are you just trying to make it easy for people? There's nothing easy about following Christ. There is nothing easy about surrendering our lives and giving them up to Christ and, and crucifying our flesh every day. So, so that's salvation. <laughs> Holiness is like the fun part. Holiness is, is the part that's, that's the extra part where we just get more relationship and more clarity of relationship with God. Salvation is the death onto ourself. So that is what we always start with. As we're going through this holiness challenge, the very first thing we're doing is stalking ourselves and dying on to ourselves, right? If you if you do go back to the original videos or the earlier videos, you see that the whole beginning was there's the law, I die on to the law, onto the law, I am dead, but onto God's law, I am I am rebirthed, I am made new. So we we went through the whole part where we described dying on to ourselves. So nothing about following Christ is easy. So what Paul is saying here is this isn't like a, uh, I'm trying to make this easy for you. He's acknowledging that the Levitical law and the Mosaic law is not the commandments of God. The Mosaic law and the, and the Levitical law are cleanup laws. They are laws to clean up sin that has been done. And then there are things that God commanded the Jews to do, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David to do and to be, and, and Levitical priests. There are things they have to do because they are a race of people who he wants them to be set aside and to look and be different than the rest of the world. Because as Paul said in earlier videos that we have done, he says, you are the oracles of the word of God. You are the ones who usher in the Messiah. So they already have their blessing. And those laws that are given to us in the Mosaic law and the Levitical law are there to separate them so that when Messiah comes, it is the fulfillment and it's easy to see that of all the gods and all the religion stories and all the Bible-ish religion books out there that we could, we could listen to and hear from, this one would be distinctly different than all the others. They are the oracles 
of the Messiah. They are the oracles and the keeper of God's promises and commandment. That is their reward. And the Levitical law and the Mosaic law explains this very clearly when you read them. That is for them to be set apart. At no given time is it ever a heavenly salvation issue. Never. God never says, this is for you to enter into heaven. You must eat this lamb or cut this thing or do this, that, and wear this thing and have your beard like this and chop the tip of your wee-wee off for this for salvation. At never any point is that sentence anywhere in the Mosaic Law or the Levitical Law. Never, ever, ever, ever. It's not ever mentioned. The only time that salvation law is given is when Christ speaks. And Christ tells us about six things, seven things. Uh, if my memory serves me correctly, it's about six things um, that he tells us we must do in order to be saved, right? If I can remember them by heart, let's see. Uh, I will probably go over this, but but I'm totally setting up the day. You can see why there was a long time getting ready for today. Uh, we must be baptized of the water and the spirit. So it's two things. We must receive the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, we must be born again, right? So that's kind of all one and the same. Uh, we must fulfill, we must hear his commandments. So if we don't know them, we have to find them. We have to hear them. We have to read them. We must hear his commandments and we must do his commandments. We must die onto ourselves, pick up our cross and follow him. Uh, and I think the other one is we have to love our, obviously we have to love our God with all our heart, mind, and soul. And of course we have to love one another as he loved us, right? We also, uh, I guess I'm adding more. The first three are kind of one and the same. Uh, so if that's one, I think we're at like five. Sorry, I'm super confusing. Be born again of water and spirit. You have to eat his flesh and drink his blood. So you have to have what's what we commonly use as communion, what the Catholics call the Eucharist. Um... You have to pick up your cross and follow him. You have to deny yourself and your life and your family and everything and follow him. You have to um, you have to love one another as he loves you. And you have to love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. Those are the seven. So these are commandments in order to enter into the kingdom of heaven. So basically, any time Yeshua says the sentence, Surely I tell you, no one will enter the kingdom of heaven. Oh, and you must become like a child. That's another one. No one shall enter into the kingdom of heaven unless they become like one of these little ones. So there's eight. So uh, these are things that must be done. These are commandments of Christ. But all of these things truly are one commandment. If, if you really look at it, all these things are truly one commandment. And that is that we are all born over here. We're all born into the sin and the um, inheritance of ignorance world. We are on autopilot and we are, we are completely oblivious to the fact that we, are, we, we see God's laws. We see what we know we're not supposed to do. Our moral compass is set and, it, and it's totally flipped. God says, do not do, I do it. God says, don't, you must do, I don't do it, right? So this is where we are. And when you take a look at all the laws that we just kind of went over, the eight laws that we just went over, they're all about being not that. They're all about being a new creation. They're all about taking your life and dying on to yourself. And if you truly love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, you will think that dying on to yourself and allowing everything you hold dear to die is a better choice. That is an expression of your faith. This is the commandment. So I know I'm being long-winded, but when you read something like this where Paul is saying, uh, don't be circumcised, which is a blatant, obvious, even Moses' son, and Moses is going to be killed if he doesn't do it, level law, right? I mean, Moses is going to be killed if he doesn't circumcise his own son. It's a high rank law. It's the reason why it's such a big deal in the Bible and the, in the New Testament. And yet, here he says, don't make anybody get circumcised, nor anybody that is circumcised. It's, it's not, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore, which is a crazy sentence to think about. Because in the same exact sentence, he says, but keeping the commandments of God. All right, so it can be super confusing. His whole thing here is he's saying, let each person come to God where they are at. He's actually going to use that sentence here in a bit. Let each person come to God where they are at. Let each person receive the, the, the Holy Spirit in them and let God guide them in the fashion in which he is guiding each individual we are not to put on our own convictions on another person. We are also, ironically, not to put the Mosaic Law or the Levitical Law onto 
the Gentile. If you are a Jew, if you were born into Judaism, the oracle law still applies, even until when Christ comes back. But if you are not a Jew, if you are not trying to live in the promises of the Levitical law and the Mosaic law, and even the Noahite laws and the Adam laws, if you're not trying to live in those promises, well then these aren't on to you, right? And so, so this is why it's confusing because are the churches right when they say that, that Christians don't have to obey the, the Mosaic law? And are they saying that the Mosaic law is dead and done, but God clearly says and Yeshua says no. Not one iota of the law will ever be written away until Christ himself comes back, right? It will never be done. In fact, the Bible says that all of what God has spoke will never end, right? So for the Jews who are the oracles of God, they are still today the oracles of God. They are still the carriers of the word of God. So for them, it is a commandment for the blessings on earth. And these commandments that God has given them are to wash away their earthly sins not for salvation, but for blessings. It is always for earthly blessings. I cannot keep your crops from corroding unless you're ripe from me. I cannot keep you from getting disease unless you're ripe from me. I cannot keep you from having enemies that attack you and consume you unless you're ripe from me. Do you see how those promises are earthly related, right? They're not heavenly related. So we as Gentiles can choose to do that as the spirit convicts us and we can go i'd like to be in that i'd really like to be in those promises i would very much like to be right with the lord and i would like to become jewish well you can you can become jewish if the spirit moves in you and convicts you to get circumcised and to and to obey all the noahite laws and all the mosaic laws and all the levitical laws you can but that's not something that according to paul we can run around saying you must do in order to be saved. Why? Because those laws themselves do not acknowledge salvation in themselves. They always point towards who? The Messiah. They are the oracles of the Messiah. Does this make sense? So I hope that makes sense. I think a lot of people hopefully are going to have a new clarity about the war in Christianity, these, these two sides. All I have to do is raise my hand and say, I believe in Yeshua and I'm saved. I have to never do anything ever again. Mm, nope, not true. You do have to do the commandments that Christ gave, uh, which we just read are eight or just off my memory are eight. There might be some more I'm forgetting about. And then the other one is that you have to, oh, you have to go back and do all the Mosaic laws and Levitical laws uh, or you're not right with God. Nope, not true. Because if that is true, then Paul's blaspheming and teaching a false thing. And the other apostles received his blasphemy and believed his blasphemy at the council. Does this make sense? And they didn't. They acknowledged he was right. So, I'm sorry. Now that we have that all established, let me read this one more time. Both of them are wrong, by the way. A, raise your hand, or B, raise your hand, because uh, this is A for you. Uh, A, raise your hand, you have to follow, you know, you have to do all the Levitical laws and, and Mosaic laws, or you're not gonna enter into heaven. Lie, total lie. B, I have, to, uh, I have to just raise my hand and say, I believe in Yeshua and my job is done, I'm going to heaven. Also a lie, right? It's, it's, it's not. So, only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to them and to which God has called them. Every single one of us are called to walk a different walk with God. Your walk has nothing to do with my walk. My walk has nothing to do with your walk. Can I inspire you? Can I be an inspiration for you to find your walk? Yes. Can I be an inspiration to you uh, through the Holy Spirit, through my uh, refinement as a human being, as I surrender to the Lord? Can that be an inspiration for you to allow refinement and surrender to come into your life so that you can find your walk, not so that you can find the Nathan walk, right? Do you see the difference here? So if I inspire you, it is to inspire you to bring in the Lord to hear your own walk to hear your own message, to hear your own calling, not so that you can imitate my individual walk or individual calling, right? That's what he's saying. He says, this is my rule to all the churches, not just you guys in Corinthian, but to every church, which by the way, as a modern body of Christ, we are a church. We are a gathering of the body of Christ. So that's a commandment to us as well. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of his circumcision. If you're Jewish, don't be ashamed of being Jewish. Has anyone at the time of his call uh, was uncircumcised? Don't let him seek to be circumcised. Don't force it upon him to say you must be circumcised or you're not right with God. 
He's saying that's a lie. He says right here, for either circumcision counts for anything nor un for neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcised, but keeping the commandments of God, which is love your God with all your heart, mind, and soul, and love one another as Yeshua loved you. That's the real commandment. That's the one that he gave at the end. Each one of us should remain in the condition which he was called. Okay, does that mean that we stay sinners? Does that mean that we stay unlawful? No. He's saying the condition meaning like just be, understand who you are. If you're Jewish, stay Jewish for sure. If you're not Jewish, don't worry about being Jewish. Instead, worry about being what you are, a Gentile for Christ, a Gentile in salvation. Were you a bond servant when called? Do not be concerned about it. Uh, so here, I'm not going to read this part because it's actually dealing with people who are slaves. And it, it's not even necessarily a spiritual metaphor. So I'm going to jump to the next one. I know I did put it on there. You can read the rest of it, but I'm already being long-winded. Let me jump to the next one, which further explains this, okay? So this is uh, 10, 1 Corinthians 10, 23, and it goes all the way to 11, 1. Now, all these, all by the way, are in... Um, uh, Mar Mariana, are you recommending to get the Holy Communion? Yes, but not as the Catholics do. I have a video dedicated towards that. We're going to address it in the very last video of the 40 day challenge. If you remember in the very first video, I said at the end of the 40 day challenge, we would, uh, we would do a communion. Uh, but I have two videos that f very fully and detailed explain the reality of the communion and the danger of doing it casually. And the Catholic Church, unfortunately, does do it casually. They claim their communion is the only true communion, uh, and that's blasphemy. Uh, and, uh, and, they're, and they also don't give the weight of the actual communion, though they say they do. So I have two videos to cover it, and I, I will post those videos uh, before, the, before we do a communion, which will probably be on day 41. Uh, we will do it, but I'll mention it on day 40. So yes, I do highly, it's important for salvation. I do recommend you have Holy Communion as, as the Catholics call it. Okay, let me read this passage. 1 Corinthians 10. All things are lawful. What? All things? This is a weird sentence for a rabbi, ex-rabbi guy to be saying. All things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Anybody got that face going on their face right now? All things are lawful, quoted, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Mm. So there's many times here in 1 Corinthians where Paul keeps talking about all things are lawful. All things, I can do, I can do anything, right? If, if the spirit of the Lord tells me I can do it, I can do it. Right. And some of you who are in the pre, you know, predisposition that no, we do need to do the Levitical laws. Nathan, you're wrong. Uh, it's not done away with. It is a salvation issue. If it was, then circumcision would be first on the list for a man to do. The second thing is, is that uh, we must not when the apostles ate wheat on on Shabbat, when Yeshua allowed them to to eat wheat, that is absolutely a death sentence according to Levitical law. Uh, there's no if, ands, or but about it. They were collecting their food on Shabbat. And Yeshua said for them to do it. He said, it's okay, go ahead and do it. Well, that makes Yeshua, as a rabbi, a sinner. And that makes him not a flawless lamb. So so if what, what we're saying here, and what we're talking about, it seems to me that Paul really understood the new covenant that Yeshua was making. All things are lawful. If you need to reap wheat to eat and, and, and be full or to, to live on, on Shabbat, then you do it. If you need to eat meat uh, that, and sit down at the table of Gentiles, which is unlawful for Jews to do, he says, if you need to go into the Gentile market and buy meat and you don't know what kind of meat it is, maybe it's pork, uh-oh, and you need to eat it because that's where you are and you're witnessing to people, eat it. Don't ask them what it is and don't ask them if it was sacrificed to other animals. And then because but these are all these are all Hebrew really intense. I can stone you right there on the spot if you do this. Do you understand? And Yeshua told the apostles to do these things. That makes Yeshua a blasphemer if if the Levitical law and the Hebrew law is a salvation issue. Does this make sense? 
if it's not a salvation issue and it's a clean up your act issue, it's a it's a separate yourself to define yourself as oracles issue, then it's holiness. If it's on to salvation, then Yeshua is a blasphemer and he is a, a, a false teacher, right? Which is the very grounds that the rabbis and the Sadducees and Pharisees use to crucify him, ironically enough, right? So all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. Well, that's an interesting distinguish, the distinguishment. All things are lawful, he says again, but not all things build up. Build up, what does he mean? Let no one seek his own, but the good of his neighbor. Okay, he's saying, yeah, you have the ability to be all things to the world. You have the ability to go into situations that according to Levitical law would be illegal and you could be stoned to death for it. You have the ability to go and do these things now, but not so that you can abuse it or so you can please yourself. He's being very clear, but not all things are helpful. Notice he doesn't say, but not all things are self-serving. He's saying helpful. Well, who are we helping? He explains in the next sentence, right? And he says, build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any questions on the ground of consciousness. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. I mean, this is a really big sentence, guys, right? I know I'm getting legalistic today and you're thinking, isn't this a holiness challenge? Yes, this is the holiness challenge and this is us understanding holiness as we move forward because there will be many who cross our paths who will say, oh, if you want to be holy, you have to do the fullness of the Levitical law. You have to do the fullness of the Mosaic law. It's a thing. You will, If you haven't experienced it already, don't worry, you will. The more you live in the world and the more you go out in the world and the more you preach and the more you share, uh, the more you're going to come across people who will throw the Levitical and Mosaic law at you and say, if you're not doing all of those things, then you're not right with God. Do you understand? So this is a holiness thing and you need to be equipped with the truth of holiness, right? Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any questions on the ground of consciousness. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions to the grounds of consciousness. Man, this is huge. He's saying if something is in front of you and it's shellfish, not allowed to eat shellfish. If it's pork, which is the most famous don't eat food in all of the Bible, right? If it's pork, he's saying don't ask what it is. Don't ask what's been done to it. Don't ask if it was kosherly crucified or kosherly sacrificed or whatever. No, 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 no. You already know it's not going to be. Don't ask about it, right? Just don't allow that into your consciousness. But he explains for what sake. Is it because if I'm ignorant, I'm innocent? Nope. Because all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. He's saying it's not because I'm worried about you who are in Christ. I mean, this is going to be big. This is going to maybe be a thing. I don't know if people are, I hope to, to God this clicks. He says he's not worried about you because you're in Christ and the Holy Spirit is in you and the Holy Spirit is guiding you. He says, I don't want you to ask what it is for the sake of the unbeliever or the people who are watching you, the people who are witnessing you, they will place ignorant judgment upon you. They will be convicted. Their own mind will be confused. If I'm seeing a Jew sitting down and having some bacon and he's like fully dressed Jew and circumcised and he does the whole, you know, move when he got, he's got the tassels from his head hanging down, he's got the beard, he's got, you know, he's not, he's not wearing normal clothes. He dresses funny according to the world like you know and then all of a sudden he's chomping on like a bacon sandwich i'm just gonna be like okay so the guy's a fraud right it's gonna be my first instinct is gonna be like he's got the whole get up he's doing the whole thing but then he's just totally chomping on some bacon right i'd be like yeah so it's a fraud the guy's just a fraud how can i not think that does this make sense okay now you have this understanding let's continue to read for the earth is the Lord, meaning everything is not sinful in the Lord. Even shellfish and even bacon is not sinful to the Lord. Not sinful in its own nature and the fullness thereof. Nothing in the world in of itself is sinful. Nothing. 
If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you are disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any questions on the ground of consciousness. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you. Hmm. And for the sake of consciousness. I do not mean your consciousness, believer. I do not mean your consciousness, the person who is walking with the Lord and has the Holy Spirit and they're surrendering moment to moment, but theirs. For the other persons, the one who informed you it was sacrifice and for the one who is watching you. For why should my liberty, Paul, be determined by someone else's consciousness? Okay, there you go. There you go. There it is. You're wondering if Nathan has taken liberties with scripture? Nope. There's the sentence of sentences. If somebody is convicted of the Levitical law and the Mosaic law, and they are feeling pulled by the spirit to do as much of it as they possibly can, it is good for them. It is bravo. Praise the Lord. That is a good thing. But if they turn around and they say, here are my convictions the Lord has put on me. Now I must spin and put it on you because I believe that what I have been convicted of means that it is for everybody. But why should my liberty be determined by someone else's consciousness? Paul says, I am free. All things are lawful for me. But I also acknowledge not all things are helpful and not all things build up. Helpful to who and build up who? Himself? No, because we are made full and we are made complete in Christ, not made complete in law. We are not made complete in, in circumcision. We are not made complete in refraining from pork. We are made complete in the Holy Spirit surrenderness, surrendering moment to moment to moment, inviting the Holy Spirit to come into us and guide us, our demonstration that we do believe God is Lord, so that we say, your way, not my way, making him king of kings and lord of lords over us. That is accounted unto us as faith, that is accounted unto us as righteousness, and therefore we walk in holiness, not our own righteousness, not our own holiness, but the holiness that is in us when we invite God in. And it is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Does this all make sense? I know it's a lot, but I hope you're getting it. We're trying to baby step here throughout the last 34 days, and I hope they're stacking up real good. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's convictions is another way that we could say it. Or consciousness, their understanding of things. If I partake with thankfulness, if I partake in thankfulness, if I am grateful that while I was starving out in the wilderness, a pig came by, fell on a, a stick and died and boom, I didn't even kill it. I didn't do nothing. It was obviously the Lord's like, here, I gave you a meal, but it's a pig. So I eat the pig and I'm thinking, thank you, God, right? Thank you, God, for this pig. Now, am I going to hell because God struck down a pig and he, when I was starving in the forest and I had no food around me and he goes, here, now you can eat this thing. And I'm just like, awesome. Paul says, if I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? Why am I in trouble for the gift that God has bestowed on me? No, I'm not in trouble because I'm grateful for what God has given me because you have an issue with it. That's your issue. That's your conviction. If you want to die and not take the pig in the wilderness that keeps you alive, then don't take it. Die on to Christ. Die on the God. And, cons and be considered holy. If you die because you were like, yes, a pig just died in front of me. I could totally eat it and survive and everything would be copacetic. But no, I would rather die and rather say, no, Jehovah, I'm going to die and not eat pig and I'm cool with dying right now. Well, then that's a blessing onto you to die that way. But if God himself says you must live, you have work for me to do or work, you're going to do work for me in your life. You must live. So eat this pig. Then if you don't eat it, you've sinned. Now that's a flip of this coin, isn't it? Yeah. So Paul says, not, he says, everything is lawful for me. That's what he means. If it is, if, if God says you must do this thing, you must go into this place that is sinful. You must go to this place where there is sin participating. If God calls you to go into the temple of, 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 of Satan, he's like, you're going to go into the temple of Satan. Well, according to Jewish law and Levitical law, you're going to hell for that. I mean, you're going, you're going to die for it. Like not going to hell. You're going to die for it. Does that make sense? Just for walking in. But if God says, I want you to go into there and I want you to go in and I want you to preach the gospel. 
Well, you're not just going in because you want to participate, right? You're going in because you're bringing, like we discussed yesterday, you're not going in to be influenced. You're going in to influence. You're going in to build up. You're going in to help, right? Do you understand the energy in which you go forth into a thing that before was illegal according to Jewish law? If you go into it bringing the gospel, if you go into it bringing salvation, if you go into it giving testimony, it not only became lawful, it became helpful. It became building up. But if you go into it and it causes nobody to be edified, if it causes no testimony, if it causes no growth in the spirit and you just go in and you're just hanging out and you're having a jolly good time because you think it's cool and fun in there, then then that's, that's not going to help anybody. In fact, it can hurt the gospel going out into the world. And therefore, that's not so good. That's what Paul is describing. Continuing on. So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. There it is. How do you know I'm telling the truth if you go into a satanic temple? It's simple because you're not going into the satanic temple for the sake of going into the satanic temple. You're going into the satanic temple to bring the glory of God, to speak the glory of God, to bring forth salvation and truth, to free the slaves that are bound by sin, right? Whatever you do, he's telling you right now, there's no option about this. If you do something, you do it onto the glory of God. And therefore, it is lawful. Mind explosion. Why were the apostles able to grab wheat on Shabbat and eat it? It was because it was blessing onto those who would survive and live and bring the gospel into the world. It was a blessing for the gospel to move forward. Therefore, it was not a break of Shabbat. Does this make sense? Because they did it onto the glory of God. Now, we could abuse this and we could be like, no, nah, no, I'm supposed to totally smoke crack because it's under the glory of God. Woo -wee -woo -wee -woo. Right? We could do that. No, because he says, if you find out, if you're in a situation where you understand that it's bad, if the meat you're eating has been sacrificed onto an animal, if the meat you're eating has not been kosherly killed and you become aware of this, you must not partake in it. Right? So if a thing is perceived as sinful by the witnesses of what you are doing, you are to refrain from it. Not that if you did it, you would go to hell, but it would not be helpful. And since you're supposed to have a servant's heart, if the first thing about you is to love one another as Yeshua has loved you, that means you have a servant's heart. You don't love for the sake of yourself, you love for the sake of others. You love others more than yourself. So you become aware of your situation and you think to yourself, is what I'm going to do raising up the gospel, bringing forth the loss, or is what I'm going to do cause some to stumble? Is this going to cause the witnesses of what I'm doing to, to fall, right? It is lawful, but it doesn't mean it builds up or it helps. Does that make sense? Do you understand the distinguishment now? That's why he's saying, if he would have taken a bite of the meat and then he was told, oh, that was sacrificed to somebody, he doesn't take another bite, but he's not condemned by the first bite. Does this make sense, right? I hope it does. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. He's including everybody in the world. Jews, Greeks, maybe Gentile, and believers. So basically everybody. There's nobody in the world not included in that. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many. He is asking himself moment to moment to moment, is what I'm doing right now the will of God? Is what I'm doing right now giving glory to God? Is what I'm doing right now offering an opportunity for somebody to say, I want to be saved by the blood of Yeshua. This is what he's talking about. It's a moment to moment choice. He is acknowledging that he wants to make everybody happy, but he's also acknowledging that he's not going to be able to. And he's acknowledging that all that he does is lawful because of Christ commands it. And he says, go and do this. Then it's not a sin. It's not a sin to technically break Shabbat. Christ broke Shabbat on many occasions, which is one of the things they crucified him of. But if he breaks it for the sake of salvation of others, then Shabbat is not broken, but the point of Shabbat is glorified. 
right? Christ is the glorification and the manifestation and the fullness of the law. The law does not exist for salvation. The law exists to point towards Christ. Christ is salvation. I know this is a lot. I hope it blesses you. Not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. There it is. If you're wondering, how do I know where the line is? How do I know if what I am doing is by my own pleasure and is me seeking my own way or if it is me doing it because the Lord commands me to? Is somebody else being saved? That's how you know. Is somebody else having an opportunity and being invited into accepting salvation? Does this make sense? If you want to know where does the law get drawn, where does the line get drawn, let's just say you keep the festivals. The Lord convicts you and he puts the festivals on your heart and, and you keep the, every single one of the festivals. You perform all the rituals. You wear all the get up and all this stuff. But one day the Lord says, I want you to not participate in the festival today. Instead, I want you to walk over to there to the satanic temple. I don't want you to participate in my festival today. I want you to instead go into the satanic festival and I want you to go and I want you to meet people and greet people and love on them and I want you to share the gospel. Have you sinned? No, because you've done it onto the salvation of others. So where does the line go? Where can we test? Am I doing this for me or am I doing this in law, in the commandment of God? Because it's on the salvation of others. Okay, now, now I'm going to read this early sentence for you one more time. <laughs> Let's go back to 1 Corinthians. Is it 1 Corinthians? Sorry. One second. This is going to make a lot more sense now, I think. Hold on, where'd it go? Why am I blanking? Sorry, guys. One sec. Why am I blind? I totally know this passage and yet I can't find it. Sorry guys, hold on. Sorry. be one I was thinking of earlier. I'll read it tomorrow. It must be for tomorrow's notes. Okay, sorry. All right. I hope this speaks to you. <laughs> I'm writing my sticky notes. More sticky notes. I hope so. All right. So how does this, just, just to wrap this up, kind of give your mind a little bit of a bow to put on this. How does this tie into with the Holy 40 Day Holiness Challenge? It's really addressing that slippery pride slope that I'm talking about. As you become convicted, the Lord may indeed convict you to do uh, Old Testament laws. He may convict you to get circumcised even. So you can't go around though and command everybody else to be circumcised. He may convict you to participate in the festivals of the, that the Jews were commanded to do, but those festivals are not on to salvation, right? They are not on to salvation. The commandments of Christ are literally on to salvation. The commandments of the Levitical laws and the Mosaic laws are on to holiness. So this is a holiness challenge. If, if, but it's not a commandment for you to do the Levitical laws and the Mosaic laws for true holiness, right? It's a holiness of distinqu distinguishment for the oracles of God, for the law to transfer and to be carried for the glorification and the pointing to of the Messiah, right? Now, does Jewish culture or do the Hebrews need you to be in them in order for Christ to be glorified? No, they don't. They are already Jews. They are born into the flesh. They are born into the bloodline and they are commanded by their bloodline for the, for the blessings upon them that they must do that. That's a commandment unto them and they have their reward for it. So think about this when you think about things. Paul at the end of, uh, of 10 
uh, Leviticus, uh, 1 Corinthians 10, uh, what, that we read today, at the end of it, this is what he says, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. So we know the line of salvation. And 11.1 1 says this, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now this is interesting. Paul is actually commanding people to not follow Levitical law. Christ himself commanded his apostles. He told them, eat on Shabbat. That's a breaking of Levitical law. So he is saying that I am imitating Christ and be an imitator of me. Does that mean to go around and tell everybody break Levitical law? No. The commandment is to understand what is greater. If you have the opportunity, and I'm going to present it to you so this can be an easily digestible concept. If you have the opportunity to do Levitical law, uh, to do, uh, let's say, a, a, a festival that is in God's commandment or a, or a hallmark paganized law uh, festival, it'd be better to do this one. It'd be better. But if God says go to the pagan festival holiday and go and be a witness unto the lost, and go be a witness and testify unto the loss of my name, of my glory, that they may be saved, then the greater choice is not the Levitical law one. The greater choice is the pagan one. Weird, right? Total, total mind screw in a way. The greater one to go to is the one where you are going and being a witness that those may be saved. If the people who are here at the Levitical law who are participating in a rite, and let's just say they're all messianic, they all believe in Yeshua, they all receive Yeshua, and they're all participating in this, you have a choice. If you don't have the opportunity in the day, right? So if you're surrendering moment to moment to moment, and you're asking God, Lord, what do you want me to do today? And he doesn't give you the option to go and be a witness unto the lost. If he doesn't give you the option to go and be a testifier unto weak souls to make them strong souls or those who are, are teetering and not totally chosen God. If he doesn't give you the option, then go over here. Go over here to the Levitical law. Go over here to the Levitical festival, right? That is good. That is glory unto him. Sure, it's good. That's, that's for you to eat from. But if you have the moment, moment to moment to moment, to feed yourself or to feed another, to bless yourself or to bless another, Paul says, choose to bless another. He could nourish himself with a bite of that meat. He could, maybe he's famish. Maybe he's totally famish. He knows he's gonna be sitting there with that guy who's a non-believer and the person wants to hear the gospel and he's like, I'm gonna be here for like at least another four hours. I haven't eaten anything all day. Now I'm going to exude a whole bunch of energy teaching this guy about the gospel, probably arguing with people in this room. I'm gonna be super drained, but I'm going to not eat the meat now that I've been told that it's been you know, sacrificed to an idol. I'm going to not eat the meat. I'm not going to nourish myself. Instead, I'm going to choose to surrender my being I'm going to surrender my time. I'm going to suffer my malnourishment and still do the will of God in the hope that somebody else might be saved. So when we get the calling from the Lord to walk righteously or, or, or Levitically righteously, Levitically or Mosaic righteously with the Lord, it is a good thing. It is an awesome and a very good thing unto our own holiness and, our, and the strengthening of our own walk and our own understanding of Scripture. But if you have 20 minutes left in your life, and you could either do a Levitical law or you could go to a sinner and you could pray, preach the gospel. Which one is the law of Christ? Which one is the law of Christ? Is it to go and be in the Levitical law or is it to go and save, this, save the lost? This makes it very, very clear. When Paul says, that's the one I was looking for, right? But, but follow the commandments of God. It seemed like it was like a contradiction. Um, trying to find where it was. Um, where he says, don't do the circumcision, but then, you know, follow the law. You're like, wait, which one is it, man? So the law is save the lost. That's the law. Serve others. Account others greater than yourself. Love one another as I loved you. Be an imitator of me as I am of Christ. Christ, Christ gave of himself and he broke what he needed to break or appeared to break what he needed to break in order for salvation to be given, Right. So this is, this is a salvation thing. It is a, it is a holiness thing. Sorry, it is a holiness thing. And if the Lord puts a conviction on you, 
whether it is to partake in a Levitical festival or holiday or Shabbat to the level that he convicts you at and you don't do it and you repeatedly don't do it and you repeatedly ignore the Spirit's guidance to do a Levitical or Mosaic law, that is a, a salvation issue onto you because you're denying the Holy Spirit. But at the same time, at the same time, you can have the same issue over here where Christ says, I want you to go to the pagan festival. I want you to go into the satanic temple. I want you to go and I want you to speak the gospel. I want you to do this. And if you say no, Lord, no, right? Be, and you're reasoning in your head, no, no, that's not good. That's not, that's not biblical. That's not what you're calling me to do. And he says, yes, this is what I want you to do. If you ignore that and you refuse that, it can also be a salvation issue onto you because what you're really doing is you're denying the will of God. You are not allowing him to come in and you're not saying your will be done. You're saying my will be done according to my understanding of scripture. But whose understanding of scripture is better, yours or his? So we have to look to scripture, the totality of it. I know a lot here. You have to look to the scripture, the totality of it, which is why it's so important to read the Bible in order from the first word to the last. And the reason why I say in order, ladies and gentlemen, is because after reading it as many times as I have in order first to the last, I've learned that it's in the order it is in because there's a blessing in the order. It's not just the words. It's the way in which the order was structured is totally ordained by God. So when you read it from the first word to the last in the order in which it is structured, it will give a special type of revelation as you go along, moment to moment, as you read page by page. It will give a special revel revelation, it will give a special understanding. If you chop it up, if you move it around and switch it around, you're not going to get the arc and the development of the scriptures into you as it is intended by God. Okay, because God is sovereign, not your understanding, right? So, so your understanding is going to be appointed by the Holy Spirit and if the Bible is the truth, so is the order in which the Bible is delivered onto us. Okay? Because it has to be totally sovereign. It can't be partially sovereign. The word sovereign can't ever mean partially. It means totality of God's will and, and grace and all powerness. Does that make sense? Okay. I know. Kind of crazy. I, know. I hope it blesses you. I'm just totally leaping with the Lord here. And I know it's getting heavier and heavier. And it's only going to get heavier over the next five days. We're coming to the end of this. So more heaviness to come. But also it is the weapon. The word of God is the weapon in which we fight our enemy. And our enemy will often come to us as what? An angel of light. We could also word that as a brother or sister in Christ. Even as a pastor or a priest or a rabbi. Right, the enemy can come to us as a, as a being of light. It can come to us as a a minister, and it can be coming to us and giving us false convictions. It can coming to us and telling us false uh, understandings of scripture, in in putting uh putting yokes on us that the person who's giving us the yoke they themselves will not lift a finger to. Right, we must be uh, wise as a serpent, innocent as a dove. We must. Always ask ourselves the question, is this serving me, even in holiness, or is it serving others? And am I glorifying God in it, or am I glorifying me, or am I satisfying me? And does it come down to somebody else's salvation? Which is crazy, because we really always think of it as my salvation, my salvation, my salvation, my salvation. And if you remember the passages we read today, Paul clearly said, I'm not worried about your consciousness. I'm not worried about your convictions. I'm not worried that you're upset because it's pork that, that, that the guy or that it was sacrificed to a demon. You know that you're overcomers. You know that nothing comes against you. I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about those who are weak around you. I'm worried about those around you who have the potential of being saved. He clearly says that. Do you understand? So, so it's, it's, it's a lot, I know. Okay, I'm done. Do you guys want the rules? Let's go or the tools. Let's go over the, the rules. The tools. Let's go over the tools real quick. We have watch yourself like a lion. Stalk yourself like a lion, both in action and in thought. Pray. 
be in constant prayer. If you have nothing to do, if you feel separated from the Lord, give the day over to the Lord before your feet hits the ground. Read the Bible every day. Why? Because as you learn, every time we read scripture in these videos, we are gaining some massive razor edge swordness that allows us to slice through the lies of the devil. Hallelujah. Be in fellowship for we are sheep and alone we are food for the wolves. Do not go out into the world outnumbered, but go into the world outnumbering them, carrying the Lord with you, carrying the Spirit with you, that you may be overcomers, that you may be ninjas for the Lord. Hallelujah. You are going to bring the Lord not to be influenced by the world. Amen. Serve others. There it is. For the salvation of others. Love one another as I, Yeshua said, love you. He loved us. He accounted us more than himself. He died on the cross for us. Crazy. Praise, worship, and testify perpetually. It's your switchblade. Anytime you're confused, anytime you're sitting there and you're saying, I don't know. For instance, today, I'm 25 minutes late because I was in the I don't know. I, had, I didn't know exactly. There were so many passages along this message today, guys, that I was, I was getting. A lot of it was just my own knowledge that I had. And then there was like what I feel the Lord was telling me. And I'm like, oh, well, this passage talks about it too. But is that a passage you want me to bring up today? You know, and I'm trying to surrender to the Lord today and asking him, which passages do you want me to go over? And I had a huge long list and he just narrowed it down to these two. So I was like, okay, but I had to wait on the Lord. I had to, to pull out the switchblade, praise and worship, and I did. I was just like, Lord, you're gracious, you're holy, I'm confused, I don't know which one, I'm just gonna praise you until you convict me. I'm gonna praise you, I'm not gonna go off of earthly schedule. If the Lord wants something to be right, I'm gonna wait. Just like Saul's like, now's the time, Samuel's not here, I better do the sacrifice. Surrender onto the Lord, even if it means your worldly schedule or your worldly things aren't making sense, Nothing looks right. This doesn't, this, you know, I, I, da, 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 you just surrender. Just surrender. Even if it looks broken, his timing is better than ours. His ways are better than ours. We trust in all his ways. Amen. Fasting. Cut out anything. Give up your food. Give up, give up things for the Lord. Let the body know who's in charge. You show who's boss. You're the boss, not the body. There's two of you. There is a body. You are in the temple. It has its own consciousness in mind. It deals with its own things that you don't have to tell it to do. You don't tell it to breathe. You don't tell it hard, the heart to be. You don't tell it to heal your cut, right? It has its own consciousness, right? Not godly spirit consciousness, but consciousness that keeps it moving and going, right? And you have to fight it sometimes. You got to put it in check. You got to show it who's boss. So fast. Be still and know he is the Lord. Whatever drama you got, whatever issues you got, all the brokenness, you like sin, you, 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 you desire a sin, you acknowledge, I like it. I gotta be honest, I really like this sin. I think it's fun. Okay, take that. Place it in the fire. And you go, Lord, I don't even know how to place it in the fire. I don't even want to place it in the fire. Give me the want to place it in the fire. Be still and know he is the Lord. Understand he's the ultimate. He is the one. He has the power surrender to him moment to moment be in the stillness let everything surface let him show you the wrong of your ways ask him lord where am i wrong with you where am i not walking right with you what part of me is not in your glory and surrender it to him knowing he's going to take it knowing he's going to burn it away and knowing you are going to be made clean by his will his grace his blood amen remove all preparations of sin remove that song from the playlist remove that tv show from your watch list Remove that thought from your head. Remove those fantasies you're playing in your head, whatever they are, whether they be lustful, whether they be uh, a drug or a drink or a candy, whatever it is, remove it from your mind. As it starts to brew in your mind, go, nope, I don't want it. Take it from me, Lord. Pull out the switchblade, praise and worship. Okay? All right. I want to hear from you. Thank you guys for your patience, both me being a little bit late today and also, once again, being heavily detailed <laughs> in this in this i appreciate you very much and i hope that the list of tools helps you once again julie my body gets sassy sometimes so does mine mine can get a little sassy i'm like mm -mm. oh no you don't jennifer god's plans are so cool i love his style me too 
I really do. Susan, read the Bible and listen to the Holy Spirit for discernment. Exactly. And when you read the Bible, pray before you read and say, Lord, give me awareness. Give me revelation. Give me understanding of the scripture. It makes a total difference. It sounds silly just to be like, really, if I just ask God, like, I'm going to read the words with my eyes in my same brain, but you're telling me that if I read it without asking, I'm going to get one thing or not get something. If I read and I ask the Spirit to come in, I'm going to get another thing. Yes. I can testify completely that every single time I do not pray before I read the scriptures, I don't get the fullness of it. If I, and then I'll even pray after I've read them and go, Lord, I feel like I'm not getting it. I feel like I'm having brain fog. I'll pray again. I'll go back and read again. And then I will get it. Cra craziest thing in the world. Jessica. And that wait also gave me a pause to pray before the video started. All, all for him. I want to hear what he has for me today. Praise the Lord. Marlene, great message today. Your testimony to us about your struggle with the passage is a wonderful lesson for the rest of us. Hallelujah. Susan, practicing the habit of surrendering bad memories each moment and living as a new creation. That's good. That's good. It is a practice. It is something that we will do continuously. Surrender, surrender, surrender. Moment to moment to moment. We get better at it for sure, but it will always be a surrender. Moment to moment to moment. Amen. Jennifer, yes, you got to pray, pray, pray. Hallelujah. Uh, Megan, praying before reading has been helping me. Hallelujah. There's a testimony I'm talking about right there. Betty, to get into heaven, what does it mean to be childlike? Uh, that's a good question. I'm trying to think if there's any kind of secret code in it. That's what I'm trying to kind of play back in my head, the scripture. Uh, but I really believe it's just being like, surrendered like truly utterly surrendered like a child in the back seat of a car doesn't have the concerns of what is traffic you know how fast is that guy is that guy next to us paying attention a child is just staring out the window and and without forcing themselves to trust their parents driving or or that the flow of traffic is going to remain good to their destination a child is 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 just in the moment and and daydreaming and and in the freedom that the lord has given them and if we truly trust that God is sovereign, uh, then it allows us to be free. Uh, ye shall know the truth and it shall make you free. And so we just have this, this childlike freedom of faith. We just totally believe and we don't have to sit there and, and be in a fight with our faith anymore. We can just get to a place where we just go, okay, this is just how it is. Whatever happens, whether it's a good prognosis from the doctor or a bad diagnosis or whatever it is, right? Like whether it's my kids are going to be okay or not be okay. I know it sinks to the thing I thought, but you get what I mean? Like we got to really understand and trust that God is going to make it okay. We have to truly trust that God is going to get everyone to the destination that he wills. And our faith allows his spirit to move through. And so when it allows the spirit to come in, and so in order for us to, to be his children, in order for us to be his disciples, uh, we are to have a childlike faith and we are just to trust completely when it doesn't make any sense. You're, you're going to drive 5,000 pounds down the freeway at 80 miles an hour, dad. I don't know if that's such a good idea when you word it that way, but okay, I trust you, right? So a kid doesn't ask those good things. They don't weigh those, those things out. They just trust. And that's, that's, that's what I believe. Uh, it's a childlike faith. I mean, he does explain it, but I'm trying to think if there was anything else. But that's pretty, that is pretty much what he says. Yeah, I'll leave. Hello from Australia, Melbourne. Sarah, Sarah Lima. Cool name. Welcome. Nice to have you here. Uh, S Sandy, kind of like they believe whatever you tell them without any proof at all. Yeah, there's that too. That's actually a thing. You tell a child something, they're just like, okay, right? That's a very good example, Sandy. Sandy, Thank you for that. Evelyn, what is the same thought keeps coming back even after you surrender? What if the same thought keeps coming back even after you surrender it? Oh, it's just the devil trying to get you to break down and be weak. And then you just say, for me, I, I have things that will come up at random that are like the same thing, the same mistake I made throughout my life. And every time it comes up, I just keep surrendering it. I'm just like, okay, Lord, here it is again. The devil wants to throw it back in my face. Take the box, place it in the fire, and then trust God burns it away. And I just give it to him. you know. And if, and if the Lord allows the devil to use it as a tester of my strength, a tester of my perseverance, uh, that could be it alone. 
that could simply be it alone for us. If something keeps coming back up, if something keeps abusing us and keeps trying to give us guilt and unforgiveness of ourselves, type of thing or, or unforgiveness for somebody else, um, it could just be the fact of uh, God using it as a, as a muscle builder, as a way for us to continue to practice that surrender and that practice that uh, be conscious of, of surrender and forgiveness and guilt and how it is still a thing that we will always uh, be working on. So uh, it's again, if you sit there and go, it's still there, it's still, it's, all, it's going to still be in your past, right? Um, Paul talks about a thorn in his side. Right? He's like, Lord, I have a thorn in my side. If you could just remove this thorn from me, he asked three times. And his answer, God's answer to Paul says, my grace is sufficient. You don't need to keep asking me about the thorn in your side. My grace is sufficient. So it, again, it's just, uh, it's just the devil's always going to bring up junk. It's, uh, there's always going to be a thing that the devil likes to poke us with, especially if it has a track record of, of poking us. If it has a track record of hurting us when it gets brought up, if it can steal our joy, the devil's going to know and he's going to like to use that one the most. So it just will strengthen us to continue to surrender it over and to quickly surrender it over. Go, yep, yeah, I did that. Thank you, Satan. Yep, put that right in the fire. Moving on. And the better we get at that, the better we get it. Yep, yep, that happened. I did do that in my old life, but that's not me anymore. I'm a new creation. I need to get back to serving the Lord. I need to get back to saving souls. I need to get back to being a witness. It won't even become a thing. It will quickly go away. If you stay focused on being the blessing, Whatever drama you had, it doesn't have time to stay drama in your head. You know what I mean? Rob, oh yes, help us all to be childlike always. Amen, amen. Carrie, great training today. Actually, each day has been. Feeling I can one day soon minister with confidence purely onto the Lord and His glory. I can see things more clearly now, so thank you for the education. Praise the Lord. Bless, blessed to have you here and blessed to know that this is serving you guys. This is, uh, that is, my, that is my only hope. By, by the grace of God, the word would be spoken and the faith would be increased and, and, and the calling would be moved forward for you. Amen. Julie, I've noticed that I've been less tense while I work these last 34 days and that because of that, I've been able to help people at work and with their day instead of feeling overwhelmed by my work and not serving others. I used to allow my mind to take over and get lost in my tasks and my work gets done anyways Bo-bam. So I realized how much I wasted so much mental energy that I also uh, has a physical impact on me too. I just love looking back on how the Lord is ever changing me. I love him so much. Praise the Lord. Totally right there with you. Hallelujah. hallelujah. Sarah Lima, uh, pray for me and my family. Will do in Yeshua's name. May the Lord bless you and keep you and work in you and raise everyone out of darkness and bring them fully into the light. Not just for your family, but for everyone's family. Because he can do all for all. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, you guys. Well, thank you very much for tuning in today, for being here, being patient, and, uh, and for picking up your cross and following the Lord. And I pray that as, uh, as possibly, possibly, the devil comes in and tries to be sneaky, sneaky, tries to be a little clever and twisty, twisty of the words of God and and the teachings of the gospel, I pray that you will, uh, you will, you will stalk your thoughts continually, stalk to see your holiness and your righteousness that the Lord will bestow upon you, and that you will uh, stalk them as you stalk your sins, stalk your holiness, stalk your righteousness. Ask yourself, is there something here that's not of God? Is there something here that looks pretty but isn't pretty? Is there something here that is self-serving or is it serving unto other salvation? And that, uh, and that that slippery slope that catches many believers won't catch you. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, I am praying for you daily on this. And I pray for you always on it. In Yeshua's name, be blessed. Be the blessing. Continue to fight the good fight. And also, hopefully you guys will come to a meetup. If you want to, there is a link in this video. And we would love to physically meet up with you. We would love to physically pray and fellowship with you, break bread with you. And, uh, and really see you guys as much as we possibly can. We do have a meetup in uh, Phoenix, Arizona going monthly now, and we have a men's study that's gonna start on the 12th. I will be there personally. Uh, if you are in the Phoenix area and you want to come to the first men's gathering meetup, it kind of like the God's Chosen Men uh, situation, but we're gonna be doing the first one on the 12th of July. And uh, there's more information in the group meetup, uh, Yeshua meetups. 
Uh, that's the name of the group. If you'd like to head on over there, our brother Richard is the one hosting it at his house and we will have more information. I will be there and for all the men, sorry ladies, this one is for guys. We're gonna have a female one too, but uh, for the guys, I do look forward to seeing you there and it will be uh, uh, bi-monthly. So every, I know that word is kind of confusing. It, twice a month, uh, the meetup is gonna happen. So every other Monday, that's gonna start happening along with a everybody meet up once a month in Phoenix as well. So I do hope that you guys will will get involved in these. Um, it's not just people getting together. It's not just people having a good time. That obviously is what's happening, but the Holy Spirit really does move and the fellowship and the, and the home-based church really is building and it's moving fast and the anointings are flowing and the gifts of the Spirit are flowing and healings are happening and miracles are happening and all sorts of things are going on at these meetups. And yes, it happens online as well. I'm not trying to say that the online ministry the Lord has given me is and, and given us that we all participate in is, is by any way means not good or blessed, but there's just more blessing when we're actually together. It's pretty amazing. So I, I do encourage you and I wanted to let you guys know there's a link for that in this video, in every single video for these, for these, uh, for these 40-day uh, challenge, okay? Be blessed, be the blessing. I'll talk to you soon.